How y'all doing this morning? All right, all right. Well, hey, um, happy first day of, first Sunday of Black History Month. And we celebrate that? All right. Yeah. I think it's important before we begin, just we as a people, we as a church, we take a second uh, to acknowledge this, this month, uh, make a plan for it as well. It's so important for us to have these rhythms built into our lives where we pause and reflect and we celebrate the goodness and uh, the legacy and the life and the contributions of great African-American and black men and women in our history. They have made this nation what it is in the face of the most extreme levels of adversity, persecution, injustice, systemic racism, and all other kinds of things. And even though we're not where we maybe want to be as a culture, we are moving forward day by day, week by week, month by month. And we in this house believe in that, and we're going to continue to pursue that. So my challenge for you would just be to participate in this month. Maybe you've never done anything about it before. You've kind of known it was a thing, and you kind of move on. And I would say find a, find a museum, find an exhibit, find a book or a movie that you can watch with your family. Tell the story. Remember the names. Celebrate and honor those who have come before us and have marked us at every level of society. Academic, political, movies, arts, science, mathematics, every level. Remember their names and celebrate them this month, amen? If you're not sure where to start, our pastor, Bishop Brett, uh, has written a book called Dreaming in Black and White. We've got some out at the Resource Center out here, or you could get it on Amazon. That might be a good place for you to start. I know in my household, we have a, we have a little book that we read to our kids that tell the stories of uh, some great uh, black and African-American men and women that, um, that they may not know about otherwise. And I say that not as any kind of statement, but because I'm 35 years old and I didn't know some of these stories. And so we take time together with our children to educate and to celebrate this moment. All right. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm very excited. Okay. I'm very excited because today we are starting a brand new series. It's called Love Sick. Somebody say Love Sick. No. Come on. We believe that the greatest indicator of your spiritual health will be seen through your relationships because what you believe about God will inform the way that you treat people. And we think we know that the greatest source of pain and frustration in many of our lives is in our relationships. And so we gotta take an honest look about what that says about our spiritual life. I think we all understand the value of love, but we've lost God's vision for it. And so we, this month, are leaning into relationships. Pastor Tellus and I have been talking about this and praying about this series uh, for a number of weeks now, thinking about what does our, our community, our people need in this time and in this season. And it is a deep, hard look at what keeps us connected, how we relate to one another. So for the, fex, uh, for the next five Sundays, we're doing sermon series um, here on relationships. On Wednesday nights, we're pressing in even further. We're doing Lovesick Extended Edition. I've got six pages of notes I can't get to today, okay? We might be here till three o'clock if I did. I'm gonna just try to not do that. <laughs> uh, no, I won't do that. Um, we have a Korean service I have to end for. But there's more to talk about all of this, and so we're gonna have a small roundtable discussions on our Wednesday night service. We're also gonna take live Q&A in that service because we believe relationship is not just about what you know, but about what you do. And so what we talk about needs to be applied, and we wanna help you apply that in your lives. I don't know if you know this. I mean, I think you know it. Like, I think you know this, but I don't know if you, like, know this. You know the difference? Like, you know it, or you, like, I know it in my gut. I don't know if you know this, but God's desire for you, his vision for you, his purpose for you is that you would have healthy, God-honoring, life-giving relationships with people. With your parents and with your family members, God's vision is that you would have God-honoring, life-giving, healthy relationships. With your roommates, your coworkers, those around you in your life, your, your pastors at your church, God's vision for you is that you would have healthy, life-giving, God-honoring relationships. And certainly in your marriage, and certainly as a parent, certainly as a member of a family, God's vision is that you would be healthy in this area of your life. That's what he wants for you. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs 18 that he who isolates himself seeks his own desire, and breaks out against all sound judgment. It's the Bible's way of saying that if you don't prioritize relationship, you've lost your mind. 
And so we are going to press in this month, and I challenge you to press in with us. Today, we're talking about the core and central theme of all relationships, which is love. We're going to talk about the source of love, the standard of love, and the supply of love. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 4, looking at three verses, verses 10 through 12. 1 John chapter 4, 10 through 12. Read along, follow along with me here. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Would you pray with me before we begin? Father God, I'm asking for your spirit to come and to move in this place, to change some mindsets, to open some eyes, to bring a spirit of revelation to us that we could see your love for what it is. Help me, Father, to be clear and to be simple and to pull all focus to you. Come and have your way among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am definitely a bit of a romantic. Uh, My wife likes to say I love to feel feelings. Uh, which is absolutely true, and I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, I do. Happy feelings, sad feelings. I don't shy away from any of it. I love it. I think that's how you experience the goodness of life. I love all kinds of movies. I love drama movies. I love comedies. I love rom comedies. I love musicals. All right? Come on, somebody in the house. Praise the Lord. Oh, you just filled me with faith this morning. <laughs> My favorite movie of all time, without a doubt, 1987, The Princess Bride. Come on, somebody in the house. Yes, God. I was so nervous. I did not know how that was going to go over. I was going to go dead silence or, okay, we got some real Christians in the house this morning. I'm so happy about that. If you don't know The Princess Bride, it's uh, probably the greatest contribution to American cinema that's ever existed. It's the story of the power of true love. Power of true love. Our two main characters, Wesley and Buttercup, they're not just in love, they're in true love. And they're young and they're in love and Wesley gets sent off. He's on a ship. His ship gets attacked by pirates and Buttercup hears that Wesley has died. And so depressed, she moves on with her life never to love fully or truly ever again. Until it turns out Wesley returns as the dread pirate Roberts. He's masked. They have an encounter. In the process of this, Buttercup, the mask comes off and she realizes it's not the dread pirate Roberts. It's Wesley. And Wesley goes, why didn't you wait for me? And Buttercup goes, you were dead. And Wesley says, death cannot stop true love. All it can do is delay it for a while. Oh! My God! Death cannot stop true love. All it can do is delay it for a while. You know, the Bible agrees with that. Song of Solomon 8.6 says, love is as strong as death. I believe love is one of the most powerful forces in our lives. Do you know why I know that? Do you know how many grown men I've seen in a home goods on a Saturday morning holding throw pillows? (laughs) Why, if not for love? If not for love? What else motivates a man? I've seen women who will ride along in a golf cart to watch their boyfriend play golf. I'm saying watching professional golf is hard enough. Watching amateur golf? Now, I would do anything for love, but I won't do that. We will do crazy things for love. We will move across the country. We will quit our jobs. We will do things and say things and wear things we swore we would never do. We will go places we never would go to, if not for love. It's the most powerful force in our lives, which makes sense as to why the devil would seek to destroy it, to rob it of its beauty and to make it common. Because what the devil can't destroy, he will corrupt. And the devil cannot destroy love. Love is from God. He can't destroy love. All he can do is corrupt it. And if I'm honest, he's done a really good job of it so far. How many of us have, not have, how many of us have been disillusioned by love? Have been heartbroken? Had an expectation in someone we love go unfulfilled and unmet? 
And we felt on the other side these scars and these wounds in our heart and going like, that's not what love is supposed to be like. That's not what that's supposed to feel like. How many of us, just as we look at what the culture calls love and the expression of love and what in this day and age has become common, we look at and go, that that doesn't look anything like love. The devil can't destroy it, but he can corrupt it, and he's doing a wonderful job of it. As Telus and I have talked about this series, we kind of were going like, we're in two pandemics here. Like, we're in a pandemic pandemic, and we're in a relationship pandemic. We're in a crisis of love. That when you look in our culture, you just don't see it like you thought you'd see it. It doesn't look like anything like you grew up hearing about what it should look like. You get in a relationship and you go, is this really what this is? I just thought it would be different. It's a crisis. But you know, God shared with me this week that a crisis makes for a great catalyst. And that you might feel like you're in a marriage crisis. And I would say, you know what, don't be afraid of that. Use that as the catalyst God intended to bring about some change in your soul and in your life and in your family. You might be going, I'm in a personal crisis. I don't know who I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going with my life. I don't have any time for relationships, let alone friends. I just got to focus on me right now. And I would say, you might be in a crisis, but don't be afraid. Use that as a catalyst. Let God do within you, within our church, within this nation, the work that he is after in our souls to bring about change and a pure view of love that he has intended for us. We are people of faith. We do not back down from a challenge. We have the victor on our side. So the day might be dark, but it's dark as just before the dawn. And so there is hope on the other side of this for every single one of us. So we don't be afraid of a challenge or of a crisis. When John writes this text to the church in Ephesus, This is a number of years after the Apostle Paul has died. And you know, being going to Grace, we read a lot of Paul's epistles, Paul's letters to the churches. And he's writing these letters to keep this church together, keep their doctrine sound, keep them united and on on mission. But Paul has passed. So John is stepping in as, as an elder and as an apostle to help bring this church back together because they're facing a bit of a crisis as well. There's new belief systems creeping into this church, and people are kind of wandering off in different directions. Specifically, there's this belief system called Gnosticism that's rising up in this church in Ephesus. Gnosticism is just from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. So if you hear Gnosticism, think think knowledge. It's the pursuit of knowledge above all else, that the highest expression of God, the highest experience of God that you can have comes through your knowledge of him. And some can attain that knowledge and some cannot. But John is writing to draw a line between the difference between what you know and what you experience. And he's writing this text to this church to say, do you want to know how you have an assurance of faith, the assurance of salvation? How do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? This is not about what you know, it's about what you do. He says, look at your life, are you living a righteous life? How can you call yourself a Christ follower and continue to sin? There ought to be an expression in your life of what you know about God. He says you ought to share in the brotherly love of the community of the church. Not know about community, participate in the community. We don't know it's not you, it's we. We become a part of the we. How do I know that I'm saved? I'm engaging in the thing I know about. How do you know that you're saved? John writes, you keep Jesus as God and head and Lord of your life above all else. When it comes to love and it comes to relationship, there's a big difference between what we know and what we experience. We know that love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. And yet how many of our experiences with love are impatient and unkind, a little bit envious, a little bit boastful, There's a difference between what we know and what we experience. We need to bridge the gap. Jesus remains one of the most influential figures in all of culture and all of history, not because he told us he loved us, but because he went around showing that he loved us, that he would sit and meet with the poor and the sick and the lame and the beggar and the outcast and the unlovable, and he would give to them and heal them, and bless them, and be with them, and he would care about them. That has left a legacy and a mark that that goes beyond religion. 
that impacts the culture at every level. So we then can't just talk about it. We've got to be about it. So how do we be about it? I think three things. We've got to look at the source of love, the standard of love, and the supply of love. Let's talk about the source of love. John says, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. Here's the thing about this word love. We have stripped it from all of its meaning, have we not? You will say the word love 50 times over the course of one meal. I love this restaurant. I love this music. I love the ambiance in here. I love this table we got right next to the whatever, right? I love these Aussie rolls. You got to get these Aussie rolls. I love these Aussie rolls. Have you had the salmon here? Yeah, the salmon. I love this salmon. I love this drink. I love our time together. I love that we're here. (laughs) We will say, I love something 50 times at one meal, and yet some of us struggle to say, I love you to our spouse every night before we go to bed, every morning when we wake up, and every time we leave the house. Some of us for whatever reason, we don't know why, but we're intentionally starving meaningful relationships of our, in our life of the love and the expressions of love that they require. I think because we have simultaneously given this word way too much significance and none at all. We don't know what it means. We don't know how to use it. And sometimes we can't say it because it means too much. And other times we say it to our schmoopy little puppy. I love you so much. <laughs> and you're going, what? What is this word? We've lost our understanding of it. So to get back a good understanding of something we don't understand, we've got to have a good definition of it. And a good definition requires a reference point outside of itself. What I'm saying is this. You can't define a word with a word. Remember this from grade school? I do. I got in trouble one time. I didn't get it. I've learned it. It stuck with me till I'm 35. I'm working through it with my counselor. Um, <laughs> You ask me to define what is a desert, and I say a desert is a desert. It's like a desert-like area with desert-like conditions. You know, if you went to the desert, you would see desert. (laughs) You can't define a word with a word. It doesn't give you any picture or understanding of what it means. You need a reference point outside of itself. Take curry, for example. When I say curry, what comes to your mind? It's a... I heard spice, Indian food, and (laughs) Steph. Some words have too much meaning. Too much meaning that a simple definition just doesn't do it. You use, I say, this curry's killing tonight. Is Steph curry on fire or is this curry spicy? What are we talking about? We don't know anymore. I actually learned that in India, there's really, I just read this this week, Curry is not even really a thing. In the culinary world, curry has become a meaningless term. It's a reductionist term to define and describe Indian food. It's mostly used in the West. The British uh, came up with the term curry powder as a spice blend, and now we have pretty much called everything Indian food curry. We have reduced the meaning of a word down to something simple, down to something reductionist, defined it by itself, and in doing so, we have now lost our vision and our understanding of an entire culture, this expression of food. We've lost the beauty and the richness and the depth and the wonder that every dish in India comes with a unique spice blend. So you don't just have one curry that you apply, but the spice blend that you use for each is unique and different. I mean, no, I'm not talking about curry anymore. Our culture has defined love as love. That's what we have said. That love is defined as when one person feels love towards another person or thing. Love is when you feel love and you can feel it towards whatever you want to feel it towards. Love can mean whatever you want it to mean. But when something means everything, how many of you know it actually means nothing? And love can now mean whatever you'd like it to mean, which guarantees it will never mean what it was intended to mean. We have taken a word, defined it by itself, and in so doing, reduced it down to something basic and common. And we have lost the beautiful richness and depth and complexity that the word was intended to show to us. If you want to define a word, it needs a reference point outside of itself. 
So the source of love cannot be love. It's got to come from outside of love. Now here's the thing. When I made Jesus the Lord and the Savior of my life, I made a declaration in that moment that I trust him with my life more than I trust myself. And I didn't just make him savior of my soul because I think that hell is scary. I made him Lord and master of my entire life. And when the psalmist writes in Psalm 138 too, he says, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And me as a Christian, align myself to his name. And I'm told don't take his name in vain. And I want to be associated well with the name of Christ. But my Bible tells me I can't just be associated with the name of Christ if I'm not also associated with the word of Christ. Which means that my life now is yielded to and subject to the authority of the word of God. That I can't just receive him as savior if I don't receive him as Lord. And so when I profess faith in Jesus and I enter into the kingdom of heaven, there are certain rights that I lay down. The right to define things as I want to define them is one of those rights. I'm no longer the master of my vocabulary. I'm yielding myself to the authority of scripture, whether I like it or not, or whether I think I agree with it or not. That is the declaration you make. You're laying down your life. Galatians 2.20, I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And now if you've never made that profession of faith, and that's not your reality, well then I wouldn't expect you to agree with this and love can be love to you. It can be whatever you'd like it to be. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we forego the option in our lives to pick which parts of scripture we take as gospel and which we take as suggestion. It all sticks, and our life is the process of conforming to the image of Christ as revealed to us through his word. The source of love cannot be love itself, and John writes, this is love, not that we have loved God, which tells me that not only can the source of love not be love itself, the source of love cannot come within ourselves. We are not the authors and the masters and the definers of love either. Take a look at the love that you offer naturally. An honest look. I bet I can describe to you in one word what your love looks like. At the base level, be honest with yourself, not when you're like all motivated for Valentine's Day, but your daily expression of love, selfish. And I know that because you're just like me. I wanna be loved my way on my terms in my timing. I like things to go the way I want them to go. I would rather you bend your preferences to mine than me bend mine to yours. Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You know why we ask for relationship advice over every other kind of advice? Because the heart is deceitful above all else. Do you know why our relationships seem to be fractured from the start? Because our heart, our love is desperately sick. We have a condition. The love of God, the source of love rather, cannot be generated from within. It's got to be generated from without. Watch how Jesus draws this out for us. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we're supposed to hear that and go, okay, so how do I love myself? Well, I'm patient with myself. I'm kind to myself. I'm forgiving to myself. I'm gentle. I always assume the best about myself. I know I've got good intentions. That's the way that I am supposed to love others. But what the devil can't destroy, he will corrupt. And now we have a gener of generation of people who battle self-loathing and self-doubt and insecurity. They have no concept of self-care or self-love. The devil can't destroy you. He can cause you to self-destruct, but he can't destroy you. But he sure can corrupt the way you view yourself. So now that when we hear the words, love your neighbor as yourself, we have a generation of people that go like, I can barely stand myself. 
I'm my least favorite person. You want me to love people like that? Uh, sure, that'll be easy. <laughs> but you know Jesus was 10 steps ahead of us from the jump, right? He had already solved this problem for us in Scripture. In John 13, he says, I'm going to give you a new commandment now. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. How? Just as I have loved you. Jesus says, here's a more complete form of what I'm trying to say. You ought to love your neighbor as yourself, but a more complete form of that, rather, for you who don't love yourself, is love each other the way that I have loved you. This makes the reference point and the starting point from love, not love itself, not ourselves, but God. He is the source and the supply of a genuine, accurate, fulfilling love. And if we define love by his standard, we get to experience the richness and the complexity and the depth and the joy of that love in each and every one of our relationships. It is clear that we have lost the vision for love. And the Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. And as I look around at our society and culture, and as I meet with many of you, I see people perishing under a corrupted view of what love is and is supposed to be. And Jesus diagnosed this in Matthew 24, 12. He says, out of an abundance of evil, the love of many will grow cold. If we don't allow God to be the source, what we get is what we're seeing in this day and age. Relationships that are corrupted, that are maligned, that are infected, and out of an abundance of evil, of wrongdoing, the love of many will grow cold. People don't want to get married anymore. People don't want to have kids anymore. People don't want to start families. People barely want to stay with the people they're with now. What is that but not the love of many growing cold in our lives? So we've lost the vision, but how do we get back the vision? I believe we get the vision by raising the standard. It's the standard of love, the second point. Let's talk about standards for a second. Let's talk about standards. How come whenever we set a standard, our instinct is to lower it? No one's ever saw a standard and gone, oh, okay, I'm going to do more than that. They go, that's the standard? I can do just under that and get by. <laughs> That's what I need to do. I'll do just below that, and that should be good enough. I've never known anybody to have their dreams come true who's lowered their standards. I've never known anybody who's happier having settled for less. And yet our instinct is to always lower our standards to a place of comfort, to a place of ease, to not press or push ourselves harder or farther. When I go to the gym... And God's honest truth, because my coach is sitting right there. <laughs> the days that are a good workout for me, the days when I come home and my wife says, how was the gym? And I go, oh, it was a good workout today. Are the days where I pushed myself to do something I wasn't sure I could do. I added a little bit extra weight. And when coach says 15 reps, I don't do 10 reps. I do 16. And I see if I can do one more and push myself harder than I thought I could. And I achieve something I didn't know I could do. And I come home walking funny. That's a good workout. I've raised a standard and I've not allowed myself to fall short of it. I go until my muscles quit. I don't know anybody that's had a good relationship that has lowered the standard every day of their life. I don't know anybody that's had a good relationship that looks back and doesn't have moments where they go, I'm not sure I can be patient again, but I'm going to try. I'm not sure if I can forgive again, but Jesus said 70 times seven, not just seven. So I'm gonna push through and I'm gonna humble myself and I'm gonna, I'm gonna I don't know if I can, but I'm gonna try. They've held themselves to a higher standard and they've gotten the result that they've wanted. And this is the problem for so many of our relationships. We expect God's strength, but we refuse his standard. We want the essence of God's love in our life and in our families and our relationships, but we will not adhere to the standard that he sets in Scripture. We want the blessing of God, but not the burden of the standard. And you will always get a relationship at the level of the standard that you set. Every time. And yet we always lower the bar. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? That's the standard. Do not be unequally yoked. It's not even like 
considered not being unequally yoked. It's the standard. Do not. That's the standard. Do we stick to that standard? No, we go, oh, he's got potential. He's, got, he's been coming to church lately. You know, lately he's been coming to church with me. You know, he's thinking about getting a Bible study. Lately he's been doing all right. But we go, honestly, he's not chasing God, he's chasing you. He's only in church because you're dragging him to church. And what happens when he catches what he's after? And y'all get married. And he doesn't have to chase you anymore. You think he's going to be chasing God? He wasn't chasing God when you found him. He's not going to be chasing God when you catch him. The Bible says, do not do this. It's a trap. I'm warning you. It will end in destruction. Yeah, but he's got potential. The Bible says, forgive one another the way that I have forgiven you. And our instinct is, yeah, but... Eh, you don't know. You, you don't know this situation. The standard in Scripture is love her the way that I have loved the church, being willing to lay your life down for her. And we go, yeah, but you don't know her. <laughs> he didn't ask you. He set a standard. And if you want what the world has to offer, by all means, lower your standards. By all means, if you want what you see in culture, if you want that experience and that expression of love, by all means, lower your standard because you will get a relationship at the level of the standard that you set. But if you want God's vision for your life, if you want God's, God's destiny for you, if you want his purposes for you, then you ought to raise your standards to the level of scripture. You gotta raise a high bar and hold to it. And you don't need to file any paperwork to do this. You don't need a counseling session. You don't need prayer afterwards. You just need to make a decision. I'm going to allow Christ to pull me up to his standard. And no longer am I falling short. No longer am I allowing this. Now I'm putting my foot down. And I'm saying this is my standard. And I do not waver off of it. The standard of love in scripture. I'll give you a quick couple examples. I think I got five or six here. I'll rattle through them quick. John says, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This tells me what? One, love is expressed through action. God loved us and he did something about it. He moved. He showed it. Love is not communicated by saying it. It's communicated by doing something about it. But here's the thing. I know most of the men in the room, so I have to also say this. You also need to say it. You need to say it every day when you wake up and every night when you go to sleep and every time you leave, you need to communicate it. But the primary expression of love is not just by what you say, it's by what you do. We can't have this light switch love. Light switch love. You heard the story of a man and, wo man and woman in marriage counseling after many years of marriage and the woman's complaining, he doesn't love me anymore, he never says he loves me, I'm just in a loveless marriage. And the man looks at her and says, woman, I told you on our wedding day I loved you, and I'll let you know if anything changes. <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> it don't work like that, that one day you say, I love you, the switch is on, and if it ever turns off, I'll let you know. We just care about our lives. Love is expressed through action, through doing. Love, too, is unconditional. Gee, God, sent the, uh, God sent his son not because we did anything. In fact, it says it's not that because we have loved God. Romans 5, 8, in this, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were opposite God, when we were against God, that's when he came and died for us. Love is shown through action without condition. If he only shows you love when you do something for him or you give him something, that's not love. That's a transaction. Love is unconditional. Whether you're meeting expectation, whether you're providing everything you can or not, it's without condition. That is how God has loved us. Love is sacrificial. Jesus says, uh, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Love is a choice. Jesus says, you did not choose me. I chose you. It's a decision that is made. It's not based on a feeling. Love is a decision I make, not based on a feeling that I choose you today, I'll choose you tomorrow, and I'll choose you the day after. And every day we're together, I choose you. Whether you make me feel the way I want to feel every day or not, I have chosen you. God says, I chose you. You know why God loves you? It's not because he made you. It's because he chose to. He decided 
that he loves you, and nothing will break that love. Love is loyal. We live in a culture that says love is fleeting. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Grab it while you can. God says through the prophet Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. My love will never waver for you. This is the standard of love that we find in Scripture. And I wonder if many of us are not experiencing the health and the relationships that we have, or they're not able to give this type of love because we've lowered our standards. And we've allowed in behaviors, attitudes, and actions that do not reflect God's love in Scripture. And we're getting the result, a relationship at the level of a standard that we've set. And there's nobody to blame but you. But the good news is again, you allow Christ to pull you up to his standard. Every day is a new day. And there is hope for you yet in every relational situation. I have seen them come back from the darkest things because God is a God who redeems and restores all things unto his name. Lastly, I wonder if maybe some of us aren't able to give this love because we've never actually received this type of love. And you just can't give what you don't have. This is the supply of love. John writes, Beloved, if God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Do you know that your starting position with God is that of one who is beloved? You know that? And you didn't do anything to earn it and you can't do anything to lose it. Your starting position with God is that of one who is beloved. And how do I know that? Well, not to insult your intelligence, but do you know what this is? The Bible is God's love letter to you. It is the story of God revealing himself to humanity throughout history. And there's an account at the beginning of this of God's original intent for his creation. It's in the Garden of Eden. And what do we have in the garden? But everything we need, fellowship with God, freedom to go about the garden. We have purpose on this earth, and we get to walk with God in the cool of the day. And God makes us in his image to participate and share in the love of the Godhead and the fellowship of, of his love for us and our love for him. This is the intent. This is the vision that God has for you that then we can take what he has given us and produce life and abundance and beautiful things and families and all that he has intended. We can tap into his creative essence and participate in creating things that we love with him. But you know how the story goes. We weren't satisfied with that. We took upon ourselves the power that only God should have to define good and evil for ourselves. And darkness cannot dwell where there is light, for light drives out the darkness. So when we sin, God has a choice, exterminate or expel. And the first great act of mercy is that God did not end the human experiment in that moment, but he sent us out of his presence and then enacted a plan that lasts for the rest of creation for him to restore unto himself us relationally with him. To have in the new creation, in the new earth, what we lost in the garden. What motivates that type of love in the face of rebellion? What motivates that type of grace in the face of disobedience? What motivates that type of patience that God is going to say, I will wait a thousand years for you? What motivates forgiveness that is new every single day, no matter how many times you go back to the same thing? Every day, it's love and only love. What motivates the gospel, it's love and only love. And when God looks at creation and sees that no man is able to live a righteous life, no man is able to make peace between heaven and earth, he doesn't abandon us again, he sends himself and comes to us on a rescue mission. And Jesus comes and he lives a life that we could not live so that he could be the sacrifice that we could not be. And as he hangs on the cross, the intersection of God's justice and his mercy, and he surrenders his spirit unto God for us, what motivates that? I'm terrible, you guys. 
I don't deserve anybody to die for me. What motivates a sacrifice at that level but love and only love? What motivates me to love my children no matter whether they love me or reject me or obey me or not? It's love. It's only love. What causes me to bear with a spouse who's unbelieving or is a pain in my side or who doesn't get along with me and to wait patiently every day but love and only love? You have been loved with that love. It is your starting point in God. He calls you beloved. And his love does not waver and his love does not fail and his love does not falter. And his love is sufficient. And that is, you are the recipient. You are the recipient of that type of everlasting love. You want to change every relational environment you step foot in. You want to change the temperature in your marriage, in your household. You want to change every relationship you're a part of. You bring this kind of love with you. You bring this type of love with you. Because when you love as God loves, you make an invisible God visible to the world. John says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And those who have never known God and those who have never seen God now have the image of a visible God in front of them. That who loves like this? I have been so wrong to you and yet you've, you've never turned your back on me. I've taken advantage of you my whole life and yet you never wavered in your love for me. I've done you so wrong, and yet you're forgiving me. Who loves like that? When you love with this type of love, you make an invisible God visible to the world. And when God shows up in a situation, when God shows up in a relationship, when God shows up in a family, things begin to change things begin to heal. That which was broken begins to get fixed. That which was hurt begins to become whole again. Where there was no hope, now there is hope because God is present in your midst. He is the source of the richest, most dynamic, most complex love the world has ever known. And if we allow Christ to pull us up to his standard, and no longer live at a low level, but live at God's level, we receive the supply direct from the source that has the power and ability to transform every relationship we have. That's the offer that's on the table today for you from God. Let's pray and ask God to send us that type of love. Lord, we love you. It goes without saying this day, but we do. And we are grateful for your great grace and your patience and your loving kindness with us. Father, help us be distributors of this love each and every day. Help us to meditate and focus on how we are the beloved of God. We have a God who loves us deeply with the purest form, a love we've never experienced before. God, let us settle in that in our soul and in our spirit. God, I just pray for every relationship in this room, God, that you would begin the transforming work that only you can bring about when you are present in a situation. That those who are here today who are hurting, who are feeling broken, who are feeling lost, who are feeling hopeless, Holy Spirit, send your hope and your faith over them. God, for those who feel lonely and heartbroken, let them feel the purest form of your love in this moment that they have ever felt. Not that I can even communicate it well enough, God, but direct from you, Lord. Would you touch the lonely and the hurting heart this morning? Church, I would just ask you, if you've never experienced this love from God, 
This gospel message was never made, made real to you, but in this moment, the Spirit of God is stirring something in your heart. He's drawing you unto himself, and you want to enter into that type of relationship with him today by giving your life to Christ, or maybe you just want to rededicate your life to Christ today and say, starting from today, I'm increasing my standard. I'm no longer living like the world, but I'm living like a kingdom citizen. And today is going to mark a fresh start for me. Would you just raise your hand? If you're watching online, would you click the raise your hand in the chat? I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that hand. Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. If that's you, just pray with me. Or if this day you just need a fresh start, just pray with me. Say, Father, please forgive me. I've been living life to my own standard apart from your will. And I've had enough of it. I repent of the way that I've lived. God, I turn and I choose this day to follow you as the Lord of my life and the Savior of my soul. Help me, Holy Spirit, every day to live according to this word for your purposes, that I might see the goodness of God in every relationship that I have. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, can we thank God for those? Bless the Lord. Pastor Tiffany will be up at the end of service to give you some next steps. If that was you who have responded, it is our desire to walk with you and not just have a moment in service, but start a journey of faith with you. Church has been so good to be with you and start this series. Come expectant for the rest of this month. There's a lot more to come.